Schönen guten Tag. Ich begrüße alle, die ich sehe und alle, die ich nicht sehe, zu dem Podium äh, über die Comic-Szene Neuseeland. Mein Name ist Stefan Panor. Ich arbeite für Spiegel Online und werde diese Runde moderieren. Und auf dem Podium sitzen vier Comiczeichner aus Neuseeland. Neben mir direkt der Herr mit dem Hut, Colin Wilson, geboren 1949. Er lernte das Zeichnen von Comics bereits in den 60er Jahren. Er ist das Urgestein der Szene. Er wird auch ganz viel gleich darüber erzählen, wie das damals überhaupt alles losging. Ähm, er ist bekannt dafür, sehr stark zwischen den Genres zu wechseln. In Deutschland vor allem bekannt für seine Blueberry-Comics. Äh, jüngst eben auch Arbeiten, die bei Panini erschienen sind im Bereich Star Wars. Oder bei Crosscult der Thriller Point Blank. Daneben Roger Langridge, in Deutschland vor allem bekannt für seine Muppet-Comics, die bei der EHPA Comic Collection erscheinen. Ähm, er kommt aus der neuseeländischen Independent-Szene. Äh, seine ersten Comics waren Funny Strips wie Fred the Clown. Und er macht seit einiger Zeit auch gelegentlich Superhelden-Comics. Er ist zum Beispiel der Autor von Thor, aktuell erschienen bei Panini. Daneben sitzt Dylan Horrocks, der klassische Independent-Zeichner in der Runde. Sein jüngstes Buch bei Reprodukt erschienen Hicksville ist eine Liebeserklärung an den Comic, äh, insbesondere an den europäischen Comic und ihn werden wir dann auch fragen, warum er als Neuseeländer nun gerade so am europäischen Comic hängt. Und ganz außen der Herr mit dem Bart, Greg Broadmore, bekannt vor allem für seine Arbeiten im Filmbereich. Er hat als Designer unter anderem an den Filmen von zu Tim und Struppi, District 9 und Avatar mitgearbeitet, ähm, hat aber auch diverse Bücher veröffentlicht, die zwischen Comic und und äh, Illustration hin und her schwanken um äh, seinen Dr. Grodbrot. Yeah, I, I wanna hear the, I wanna hear the name from you. Dr. Grodbrot. Yeah, but that's close enough. I, I made a terrible name. I know that now. Yeah. When I first started it, I just made some sounds when I first came up with that name, and I've regretted it to this day. But it's stuck. Yeah. And uh, so there it is. <laughs> I always have a knot in my tongue when I when I. <laughs> it's terrible. Okay, so uh, let's start with a with a discussion. Colin, just uh, just for beginning, you were born, say, very early. Uh, uh, I could, what, what I, could I, was, tell, I could. I was born a long, long time ago. In a uh, you far, were born far a long, away. long time ago in a land far, far away. <laughs> and what kind of comics did you read back then? Um, in the days when I grew up in New Zealand, um, most things from the UK and from uh, the the states were available. But I really loved uh, the, the the English language comics from the UK. I grew up on the Eagle comic, which was a huge, big thing for me in the 50s and early 60s. And uh, and then I also saw a lot of um, the little war picture library. Air race type of uh, Second World War stories that uh, were hugely popular at the time as well. Mm. Were there any uh, New Zealandian comic artists at this time? No, at that time I was completely unaware of anything uh, being produced in New Zealand. There were at the time, but uh, comics were such so marginalised in those days in New Zealand that uh, you had no idea that other people were out there doing professional work and. Uh, and 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 getting things published. It all seemed to come from overseas, uh, which was kind of the feeling you got about so much of the media in the 50s and 60s in New Zealand that it was things were happening overseas and we got them uh, three months later uh, in New Zealand. And it were mostly those, you, you mentioned Eagle, it was an adventure magazine for boys, if I'm yes, right. Yes, it was. It was part of a, a, of, a, of a series of different magazines, but it was beautifully produced, a weekly comic uh, tabloid format, um, and employing some of the really best of the English talent at the time. This was the time when, when was it Dan Dare on the cover? Or? Yes, Dan Dare was the big character, uh, and uh, he was certainly the one that I remember most uh, of the period. Yeah, then um, there were... A time in New Zealand at, at 1952 around uh, when comics were very much marginalized, uh, almost forbidden. Um, uh, Dylan, could you tell us something about it? Yeah, um, it was it was the time when comics all over the Western world were being um, demonized, and there was a fear that comics were turning children into juvenile delinquents and sexual deviants, and um, all true. All of which turned out to be true. <laughs> but, um, But in New Zealand, what that led to was uh, a campaign against comics and a series of questions asked in Parliament, and eventually a committee was set up to censor what comics were allowed into the country, and most of them were not allowed into the country from America, anyway. It was definitely American comics that people were worried about. Um, but there was a, a book called Seduction of the Innocent by an American psychologist, Frederick Wortham, which was about how terrible these comics were, but it was full of illustrations from American comics that you could not buy in New Zealand. So my father, who was a comics fan in the 1950s, 
found that in the public library and took it out pretty much for a whole year, just taking it out over and over again. Because it was the only way to get to see these fabulous pictures that really ought to have been banned. Yeah, so we know the Wertham book was very, uh, say, uh, it destroyed uh, very much the comic scene in the USA. Was the Wertham book uh, as important in New Zealand? Was it only the Wertham book or were there any, any other f Well, there wasn't, there wasn't really a comics industry in, in New Zealand to destroy. Um, but, so it kind of... Yeah, but the, um, <laughs> as, as Colin said, those uh, uh, imports... Yeah, it was, it was all imports, but even, you know, it was mostly British imports anyway. So the comics panic in New Zealand was, was um, it was people getting terrified about, about comics you couldn't buy anyway mm. in New Zealand. So it was, it was all a bit silly, really. <laughs> What about the French imports like Hergé or such thing? Were there any Hergé, Tonton books around? I'm aware of translations into English of uh, Asterix and uh, Lucky Luke probably um, and of course some of the Tintin books were available on hardcover in the 50s when I was at school uh, but that was really the only thing we were aware of we had no idea that there was a whole range of product being produced here in Europe uh, that was similar to that What interests me is um, so you grew up in, in a time when there were almost no comics around uh, well, Except for it, Except for the, uh, um, the the war comics and the and, and eagle, uh, but they were very much hard to find. Um, they were probably in newsagents, but tucked away in the corner. Is this because you draw action comics now? You do war comics a lot and um, western. In, it's not something I search out actively to do, but uh, the main uh, story I've been involved with in the last 10 years that's been a war comic is Battle of Britain, mm -hmm. which uh, Garth Ennis and I worked on pr particularly as a homage to the the comics we both loved when we were when we were kids growing up. Um, yeah, because you, when you grow up in a culture without comics, how, uh, how, how come the idea to get a comic art, to become a comic artist? I, I think everyone, it's natural. It just comes out. If you want to draw, you yeah. want to tell stories. And uh, certainly I've done that since, uh, since an early age. I was very lucky to have parents that encouraged me to carry on drawing because I think they thought there was no future in it. Um, but it's just something I've always done, and I think all of us here have always done. It's a natural thing that just you're driven to do, um, being an artist, to, uh, to work towards something without a thought of it actually becoming a, a, a way of earning a living. Roger uh, and, and Dylan and Greg, of course, was it natural for you when, when you, were, you were a lo little bit younger than Colin? Um, yeah. Was, was it, were you growing up in a comic cult, in a, in a culture that accepted comics, or were, there still, were they still marginalized? Um, I think that, yeah, certainly when I was growing up, they were, they were fairly marginal. Um, the, uh, the thing I was first exposed to was Karl Barks's, um duck stories, um, and they, they were considered pretty safe, uh, yeah. even though if you read them, there's a lot of cynicism in them, <laughs> you know, that they're, they're not as safe as they're made out to be, but uh, um, yeah, they, I think that, you know, they, they were always marginalised. Um, And uh, I don't remember having them confiscated at school because they were trash, you know, and that sort of thing. So, uh, so yeah, it, it, it was sometimes uh, an act of dedication to, to be a comics reader. Yeah, I know. I'm from Eastern Germany, and uh, yeah. the same happened to me. <laughs> But it's... Uh, uh, Different reasons. You are not a communist regime, if yes. I'm wrong. <laughs> I'm not wrong. Um, so, yeah, when you grow up, when, when you are young, when you are maybe an aspiring artist or a fan... Um, How do you uh, contact? Did you know each other? Was there a fan scene in which you could do your first steps? Um, when I first started, uh, when I first had the idea that I could could actually be a professional cartoonist, I mean, I'd wanted to be a cartoonist since I was six years old, but uh, I think the switch in my head that went, I want to be a cartoonist, um, it, it switched sometime when I was 17 or 18 to, I am a cartoonist. Yeah. Now I just have to find somebody to pay me to do it. Um, And about that time, I started to discover people like Dylan, um, not personally, but I saw his work in the university newspapers and things. And so I was aware that there was a scene, um, and the local comic shops, uh, which had started a couple of years earlier, there, there weren't any comic specialty stores in, in New Zealand uh, when I was growing up, until I was about 15 or so. Um, they had local comics published by... Um, well, initially by Dylan and, and a friend of ours, a mutual friend of ours called Cornelius Stone. Um, and by the time I sort of started entering the scene, I think Dylan was about to go to London or had already gone, and um, it was Cornelius I was dealing with. Um, I, I sort of got to know a lot of the local cartoonists through Cornelius. He's, he's one of these people, or at least he certainly was then, who, who just knew everybody. So 
um, there was a lot of socialising going on between the cartoonists mm. at that point. Yeah, D yeah, yeah Dylan. I was just going to say, the first time I met Roger, um, I don't know, he must have been, what, 19? Uh, probably, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, but what he says is true. He was already a cartoonist in, in every sense of the word. He, I remember him handing me this tiny little photocopied mini comic, and I was, my reaction was basically, "Holy crap! <laughs> <laughs> this is nice. it's like it was completely professional. It was absolutely superb. Um, so it really was just a matter of could someone publish this? And and then they did. Fantagraphics yeah. in America did Let's start go. publishing Roger's comics. So. And there was this magazine Colin did, if I'm not wrong. Colin, you did a magazine in the 70s. Yes, I um, discovered the world of fanzines in the mid-70s, uh, illustrating um, small uh, fill-in pictures for a, a friend science fiction fanzine and discovered that there was this thing called fandom uh, and I could actually participate in it by producing a fanzine about comics. Uh, and I started the first issue pretty much by my own, but uh, I began to realise that there were other people like myself that were around that were doing really, really good work, usually in their spare time, with no idea of it being published, and suddenly we had a chance to, to publish it in our own little fanzine, and uh, for two or three years I produced, uh, over two or three year period, I produced ten issues of strips, um, which really was a wonderful way of getting in contact with like-minded people who normally I wouldn't have known was, were even around me at the time. So by the time I, uh, I finished off that to leave to come to the UK and seek my fortune as a comic artist, uh, it was a surviving fanzine and a really a bit a development of a little community of other like-minded people. Strips was the name of the magazine. Yes, it was. Yes, too. Um, did it sell? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Selling it was the least of my priorities. It was really a way of just producing work and seeing my own work and other people's friends' work in print. Um, it was not done. I had an inexpensive way of uh, producing it, and uh, I used to assemble each issue uh, on the kitchen table of my of my flat at the time and uh, just send them to people and send them to comic stop stores that were just starting to be in existence um, and without any idea that anything, any money would ever come back from. I was pretty much giving them away. Distribution seems to me the hard fact. As I mean, if there is no comic scene, maybe no comic shop scene uh, network, I don't know how to sell a comic. Well, I think distribution is still a major problem yeah. for when you're self-publishing. Uh, um, comic stores are around and a lot more numerous than they once were 20 or 30 years ago. But uh, once again, it's a real problem for people because self-publishing is the way that we all start uh, uh, and it's very, very hard to actually get what you're producing out to, in front of the public. Um, and that's one of the big advantages at the moment with the internet. It's a way of actually breaking down that barrier and getting out and getting your work out there in front of people. Yeah. yeah, in a way, drawing the comics is only half the battle. You've got to um, also be a businessman in a way. You've got to have... Um, distribution skills, you've got to have um, organisation skills, you've got to have all these other disciplines going on at the same time as you're actually able to produce the comics. So, um, yeah, anybody who's doing it in New Zealand has to um, has to surmount all those obstacles. So, Roger, Dylan, maybe Greg, did you read Strips? Did you did you know uh, those Strips magazine? I think Strips is probably a little bit before my time. I knew of it, yeah. <laughs> but um, I grew up in a little, little town as well, and so uh, there was no comic shop. You know, I would just go down to the newsagent and um, find whatever there was, like 2000 AD and, and Mad Magazine. For me, I actually most of my comics were actually given to me by my grandfather, who um, worked at a pulp and paper mill. So there was probably comics coming into the little town where I'm from, and then most of them weren't selling, and they get the covers ripped off, and they go to the paper mill to go turn into paper pulp again. And he would grab stacks of them for me and give them to me, so I would find all these comics like that. And um, the thing for me is I would, I would find finally one of them amongst all the comics that I really liked, like a 2000 AD or something, and then I'd pour over it, and, and then the next day I'd come back to find it, and he would have burnt it. <laughs> and the same thing with all my artwork. I would go away and I'd draw all my favourite things and then I'd come back, where's, where's my artwork gone? My granddad had thrown it in the fire. <laughs> that sounds hard. Um, we were talking now about the 70s, maybe early 80s. Were there any conventions, comic conventions, where we could socialise? Anything? No, nothing like that that I remember. Not until the, I mean, in the, really the 1990s in New Zealand conventions. <laughs> but, but strips, I was aware of strips when I was at school, and it was a huge inspiration for me, um, partly because the quality of the work was so good. It was some of the best work I was seeing anywhere. And um, I became aware of Colin. I th you'd probably already left, I think, left New Zealand by the time I was aware of it. Possibly, yeah. yeah. I left at 80. Right, yeah, it was just after that. But I remember I did a project at high school on New Zealand comics, and it was just an excuse 
to ring up um, anyone I could find from strips and go and interview them. So I went and interviewed a few people like Lawrence Clark and Barry Linton. And it was just, for me, it just made it all seem possible. It made it seem like, you know, I'm just some kid at the bottom of the world, but, <clears throat> but I could do that too. You know, it was very exciting. And there are cartoonists in there who are still a big source, source of inspiration for me, like Colin and Barry Linton, who is a really significant New Zealand cartoonist who has nothing in print anywhere in the world right now and no website, and, but, <laughs> but he's, he, to me, he's one of the great cartoonists. The thing about Barry is if you want to see Barry's work, you have to actually go to his house and go to his bedroom and ask him to show you the pages. That's how you read Barry <laughs> Linton's comics. But he's done, he's done, he's done uh, three and a half graphic novels in the last ten years, which are absolutely beautiful, but they're in his bedroom. So <laughs> 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 one day... I should, I should say as well that the first comic I, I Really, I ever bought that I saw in a newsagent, I think when I was probably six or seven years old, was a comic called Captain Sunshine that Colin had illustrated. And I, at the time, I think my mum maybe or someone, or maybe I read it in the fine print that it was from New Zealand, but I didn't quite compute that. I, I couldn't, I didn't realise it was there next to a Star Log, which was the, um, a Star Lord, sorry, which is like antecedent of um, 2000 AD. So they were equitable to me, they were the same thing, but all comics came from overseas, and I couldn't quite believe that this one incredible looking comic that actually looked better than almost everything else in the store was from New Zealand. So I didn't actually even, that didn't even make any sense to me actually. So it, it's actually kind of strange to actually finally have met you. Actually, I've only met you, Colin in the last few weeks. And so it actually finally makes the connection that, oh yeah, the New Zealander actually made this incredible comic. Yeah, he's real. He is, uh, he's a real person. He's yeah. a real person. Poker. He's not, he's there. So they tell me. Yeah. Um, and then, then Colin, then you... When strip was strips was at its height, then you suddenly left New Zealand and the New Zealandian comic scene clashed, or what happened? Oh, I don't, uh, probably you're thinking maybe it collapsed, but I don't think it did. Collapsed, uh, yeah. I, I certainly um, went off overseas in 1980 uh, on a holiday. I, was, I had no concept of actually seeking my fortune in the sense of becoming a professional mm. comic artist. Uh, I just happened to strike up very lucky living in a squat in London at the time, um, being dragged across by another artist who seemed to see something interesting in my work to 2000 AD, and suddenly people were paying me money to do something that I'd done all my life uh, for the fun of doing it. Um, so uh, a, a, an opening, a, a possible career opened up in front of me. Yeah, but to, to get things straight, there were no comics publishers in New Zealand at this time. No, I think and there are very few these days as well. Um, it's, it literally is, is, a, is a very, very small market. And um, coming to an event like this and actually meeting these guys from New Zealand that are, that are the peak of what is now a little industry of self-publishing and people doing really interesting things is really, really important because 30 years ago when I left, there was very, very little happening. I passed my strips fanzine on to some other guys that carried on publishing when I left and I lost contact with most of the people because I um, uh, turned a, a month's stay in the UK into 16 years away from, uh, from New Zealand and Australia. But um, it seems that there was a blossoming from that period that gradually produced work in New Zealand that was proud to be from New Zealand. But we still have problems, I think, with um, actual professional publications and distribution of comics in that part of the world. So if, uh, it's impossible to get jobs, to get paid by doing comics in New Zealand? Uh, I think probably it's still difficult. Uh, yeah. It's a question to all of you. Uh, yeah. Can you make a living out of comics in New Zealand? You, you couldn't make a living make, sorry, so making a living selling comics to the New Zealand market. It's just about impossible. I mean, there's, there's four million people or so, so you imagine what small proportion of that uh, actually read comics. So you have to you know, look to the, to the world if you want to sell your comics. So that's why I think everyone in New Zealand that even thinks about making comics is, in, is driven and passionate because they do it obviously for love. You know? There's no other reason to do it. You can't go and just meet a publisher uh, and say, I've got a comic, do you want to publish it? It, it just doesn't happen. It doesn't exist. In a way, that's the, that, the joy of New Zealand comics for me is that they're all done because somebody really, really wants to do them. There's no cynicism involved. There's no, you know, second-guessing some imaginary market. It's all pure. Yeah, exactly. There's no marketing thought at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, I mean, these days there are a number of New Zealanders who are making a living from comics in New Zealand, but they are doing it by being published overseas. Mm. So someone like Ben Stenbeck, who um, his work's being published by Dark Horse, but he's doing it full-time, that's his, that's his job. 
Um, and there's a lot of us, like myself and Greg, who are, we're doing other things as well, you know. We're, we're doing comics, but also illustration work, or um, I, I do a little bit of teaching here and there. You know, I, you, you piece together. But it's the same with every artist and writer and musician in New Zealand. There's very few artists in New Zealand who do exactly what they want all the time and make a living from it. Um, or probably everywhere in the world. I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know some poets and yeah. and great poets who are you know acclaimed all around the world. And boy, they make comics look like like you know we're living high on the hog. I think the teaching thing is really important too because that completes the loop that was not possible back in the in in the in the earlier days. Because now we can actually show that we're producing work and it's a way of actually expressing yourself. Uh, that's something to aspire to. We mightn't be able to um, offer a, a huge possibility of being professional comic artists in New Zealand for New Zealand publishers, but by actually teaching it, it shows that it's something that's a little bit more respected than it previously used to be, and it's also a first step to actually having better coverage in the media of comics, uh, which is something that has always been a major problem uh, in in. New Zealand and Australia, uh, comics are still treated uh, in, in the zap powy, um, silly kind of media coverage, and it's very, very hard to break through that to actually show that it is a, a creative medium that's as valid as any other. Very much like in Germany, I have well, to say. I don't think so. The comics are much more integrated, it seems, into the, in society. That, no, no, it's, in, 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 you don't think so? it's very much <laughs> wrong. I, uh, when I do a story about comics as a journalist, I always have to find a way to, to make it. It's very tricky. You can't tell. I cannot tell a good story about a comic. I, I just have to find a way. Like, oh, this comic will save the world, or, the, the, or at least show me, tell me how it is. If you think you've got it tough here, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm glad. There is another, there's another very big change that's taken place in New Zealand just in the last few years, which is that the graphic novel revolution has really hit New Zealand. So the very first graphic novels published in New Zealand were a long time ago. It was the 1980s. And it was a series of three graphic novels by Bob Kerr and Stephen Ballantyne. The first one was Terry and the Gunrunners, and then Terry and the Last Mower, and uh, Terry and the Yodeling Bull. And they were, they were, <laughs> they were fantastic. They were modelled on Tintin. So they were, or Tim und Struppi, so they had a similar kind of approach. Um, but they were full of delicious little New Zealand details, um, even little references to famous New Zealand paintings. Um, it was a lovely series, and it was very, very successful. It led to a children's television series that became a phenomenon in New Zealand. So we briefly had a little flowering of graphic novels before we even had the phrase graphic novel. Yeah. But then it kind of subsided, and... Uh, it's just in the last few years that New Zealand publishers have really started publishing graphic novels. So uh, there have been three or four in the last couple of years. Um, Chris Slane did a book about New Zealanders in World War I. Um, uh, Ant Sang, a Chinese New Zealander, did a, did a wonderful kung fu story called Shaolin Burning. Um, Chris Gross did a, new, a book about New Zealand history. And my book, Hicksville, was finally published in New Zealand. 14 years after it was published everywhere else. But, but what Except that, Germany. And in German. <laughs> it's now in German. Um, but the, the, that shift is, to me, really significant. And um, it's part of the New Zealand media and uh, literary festivals and academia and so on are also now very interested in graphic novels. Mm. So I would say... We're going through a tran transition right now from being basically an amateur scene with a few people who go overseas um, to, to really starting to build a, a genuine local comics industry. Yeah, I, I would say as well in the, in the last few years, in, I mean, I, my, my, where I've um, made a career in the last few years has been in the film industry, and I think that, um, that area with Peter Jackson having made The Lord of the Rings and made, making it such a worldwide phenomenon and then other filmmakers coming to New Zealand and, and working off uh, the infrastructure that we've built there, I think there's like a blossoming of the creative arts, especially fantastical arts and so on that are in science fiction, of which comics is kind of a, a part that has actually floated, you know, raised the whole level and raised the consciousness of people within New Zealand. So, for instance, in the last couple of years, a friend of mine, Paul Tobin, has released an art book called White Cloud Worlds, which showcases... 
um, New Zealand some fantastical artists who are some com uh, comic artists, some concept artists, some illustrators, and they're all part of the same same scene. They're just wanting to find an avenue, and, and now those avenues are starting to emerge. I have another friend um, from Christchurch who's making a comic, an anthology at the moment called um, Faction, which is... Um, Again, just it looks like an incredibly professional product, and there's, fi there's finally things starting to pop up. And I think it's, I mean, I, I think uh, I, it might be aggrandizing to some degree, but I look at what Peter Jackson and Richard Taylor have done and really think they've raised the consciousness of what New Zealanders think is possible. You, know? you came from, from the film, you mentioned Peter Jackson and such. Um, it's very unusual to, to move from film to doing comics or, or books. You do something like a comic and art book mixture, if I'm right. Um, was it? Uh, did you move because now it is possible? Yeah, partially. I mean, I, I, I've always just been a creative person. I've loved making comics. I loved writing little stories. I loved making illustrations, playing music. I played in a punk rock band and metal bands for years. To me, it's all just a. There are just creative outlets, and I gravitate to things that interest me at the time and do them. And comics was one part of that, and it was a major part of it for me. And um, so I was just incredibly lucky to be at the right place at the right time when, when uh, the film industry was sort of blossoming. And then when I realized that the opportunities that working in films had given me, I realized I can, I can do a comic now, you know, I can do a one at a higher level. I'd, I'd done small comics, I'd done little 50 cent comics that I'd photocopied and taken to the comic store, and I'd done a they little... Were great, they were great little <laughs> mini comics. Thanks, I don't know if you know you'd ever seen them. I don't even remember ever making like about 20 or 30 of them. Yeah, dinosaurs, giant robots and tanks destroying yeah. Wellington. It was yeah. awesome. That's, and that's the same stuff I do now, more or less. <laughs> and I haven't grown up. But um, uh, so through that, I had the opportunity to, you know, make other, these other comics, my Dr. Broadbots works, and, uh, and do three different books of those and have them published through Dark Horse and, uh, and now getting out to the world. So I don't think those op that opportunity, that, that sort of leverage would never have come to me personally if it wasn't for being in the right place at the right time with the way the, the film industry blossomed. Because to me, they're equitable. I don't see working on District 9 uh, as any different to publishing or releasing my own comic. I, they're, I, they're just creative enterprises, and they're, if they're creatively satisfying, then that's all I'm after. You have way more creative freedom. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. When you're working on a film, you're part of a massive collaborative effort, and you may not agree with every single decision that's made. But with a comic, it's, it's your vision. It's, you, you know, you get to to invent what you want, and I can um, take it to a, a place that I wouldn't have great trouble taking it to if it was a film. It would be incredibly... Well, again, that's expensive. a benefit of um, New Zealand comics is that it's on that kind of grassroots level because uh, when you get into so your Marvel or DC comics, I think you have you know the same sorts of constraints you have with the film industry. You're basically told what to write and who has to be where and what, so they can cross over in this month and all this sort of thing. Yeah, um, yeah exactly. So, yeah, I think the, the grassroots sort of level of New Zealand comics is a great, uh, a great boon. Yeah, totally. It gives us a different perspective and we're not just running after making the same sorts yeah. of stories and trying to fit into the same formulas. Yeah. Um, when, when Dylan mentioned um, the graphic novels, which are now maybe trending in New Zealand, does manga, ha manga have has any influences? How big is it? What? Yeah, there, there's, there is a growing manga scene in New Zealand and um, whenever I visit a school and I start talking about comics, the comics they know are usually manga. So... Um, I think that, that the influence of manga is only going to grow as, as that generation becomes our next generation of cartoonists. Um, the, there are a number of New Zealand cartoonists who've been drawing manga and, um, and getting them out there. There's uh, a, a young woman in Auckland who did a fabulous, a really very, very impressive manga book. Um, it's in the yaoi genre, those of you who know about manga. <laughs> Um, so it's a very specific audience. Um, what is what is Yowie? <laughs> Yowie. I don't actually know. Am I, is this a bad question to ask? <laughs> no, uh, Yowie, um It's also known as boy love comics, and they're they're love stories between two men. Um, but fantastic. They're fantastic. Where do I find them? <laughs> I'll I'll slip you some later. All right. Thank you. They, um, so they're love stories between two men, but they're mostly drawn by women, and most of the readers are women. So they're not really produced for gay male readers. They're produced for women, and they're just a romantic fantasy um, that sometimes gets quite steamy. Um, and they're enormously popular. They're hugely popular in Japan, but they're increasingly popular around the world as manga um, spread everywhere and. So this young woman in, in Auckland has done this really, really good, really lovely um, Yaoi book, which 
which is is getting quite a following. So, you know, it's it's happening everywhere, manga. Yeah, once again, I have to tell, it's a lot like in Germany. We had the first manga boom 15 years ago, and then we had a lot of great female artists, which most of them doing yaoi. I, I have sometimes the feeling uh, it's, they are very big in yaoi, and the, that's the question. Um, um, I, I, you know, I sometimes think um, the women of the West have been waiting for yaoi to arrive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's are like. You say, are you saying we sh we sh we should all be doing yaoi comics instead? <laughs> is this where the money is? <laughs> anyway, let's talk about. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I'll also I'll just say that New Zealand um, that the manga influence is coming in a lot of ways. So uh, the kids grow up watching Dragon Ball on television and and Sailor Moon and so on. And um, and we've now got a Dojinchi festival, a, a sort of fan comics festival in Auckland and the cosplay scene is going berserk in New Zealand it's huge um, and, and to me those are really interesting new developments and it's changing the whole scene it's affecting comics all over New Zealand a lot of female artists because we are all men on the podium and, and our history of New Zealand in comics seem to be a history of men so, so does it change? I don't know, more female artists? Yeah, that's changing enormously too, just like it is everywhere. I think all over the world, comics are, are no longer... There have always been women doing comics, um, but they often haven't been as visible as the men doing them because of the nature of the industry and so on. But um, manga is helping to change that too. But the other thing that's helping to change it is the more serious, mature graphic novels. So uh, artists like Marjan Satrapi in France and um, Alison Bechtel in America. Their books are having a huge influence and they're showing, they're showing young women and girls who are interested in comics that they can have a voice and get it out there too. So I would say that of the young cartoonists I meet, the emerging cartoonists, maybe half of them are, are young women, maybe more. Mm -hmm. you know, I think, and that's the same in New Zealand. We have artists like the, the, um, the woman I mentioned who who publishes under the name Akira Atsushi, um, but also Lee Chen, who's a young cartoonist in Auckland who does web comics. And she's got something like 40,000 regular readers around the world and recently published a book of her comics. Um, Sarah Lang, who's a New Zealand novelist who started doing web comics and is now doing comics for magazines in New Zealand. She's, her, her next novel uh, includes a comic section as well. I mean, it's, it's shifting very, very quickly. Are there any classic female artists in New Zealand? Some some women who had influence on comics in the last 50 years? Um, we have a very famous painter called Rita Angus. And um, she did comics in the 1930s for the Christchurch Star. Beautiful, strange Art Nouveau comics. Um, but not for very long. But no, it was very much a male scene yeah. until... Uh, there were Again, there was a few exceptions, but... Um, you know, it was very male until, I'd say, the 1980s, 1990s. So we have this male comic scene, influenced a lot by British comics, later on by, by French and Japanese comics. Is there anything um, which you, any one of you, would consider to be specifically New Zealandian about the comics made there? Anything where you say, oh, this is, uh, only my country can do this? Um, it is, it's hard to say because... Um, I think comics all over the world are very global and there are particular comics styles and cultures that emerged generations ago, like the Franco-Belgian scene and the American scene and the manga scene in Japan. And, and they're very distinctive because they emerged at a time when, when there was a lot less communication between countries. Um, I feel as though the comic scenes that have emerged since those tend to be heavily influenced by comics cultures from all over the world. I think if there's anything distinctive about New Zealand comics, it's partly that, that New Zealand cartoonists grow up reading comics from all over the place, and particularly European comics. So our scene is, I would say, just as influenced by growing up reading Tintin and Asterix um, as it is by American comics or even the English comics. Um, and the other thing is, is what what everyone's been talking about, which is that because we don't have a dominant industry, we produce a lot of very diverse, very unique personal voices um, because people are doing it out of passion and they're doing it without being part of a, a local industry. 
Also, I think there's um, a lot of uh, New Zealand concerns that creep into our work. Well, Dylan and I were talking about this earlier today. Um, without us really realising it, I realised um, somebody pointed out to me recently that the work I'd done for Marvel Comics um, was all about the expatriate experience. It was about somebody leaving their country and going overseas. and um, It was Thor, basically, being banished from his home um, kingdom. Um, but that was also my experience, leaving New Zealand and going to London. Um, and so a lot of this stuff creeps in without you realizing it. So um, what, uh, there's something about you two, are you, Dylan, you do mostly indie stuff. You do your same stuff, uh, which you own. And you two doing mostly franchise comics, if I'm right. Uh, you do the, I have, yeah. the Star Wars and, and the blue, uh, earlier on the Blueberry stuff. Uh, don't you want to do something, especially Colin, um, did you ever have to feel the, the need to do something your own? Uh, I had done a little bit uh, at times, but it was uh, just at a time where I moved to France and we wanted to um, get something published in French uh, for a French publisher, mainstream publishers, and so I realised very quickly that uh, it was probably better to work with a professional writer um, and, uh, and, and develop a collaboration because, uh, for me, I have certain ideas and certain themes and certain interests that uh, are, are more personal that I've always got in the background uh, that one day I could do something like that. Uh, it's just that you get tied up in, uh, in, uh, in regular commercial work, in my case, uh, and developing good collaborations with good writers, uh, which draws something out of me that I wouldn't normally uh, expect that I would do for myself. Um, so that's kind of been my path, but there's always been a, interesting ideas that I'd like to, to work on if I had the time. And unfortunately, one of the things is when you're um, working for a living in comics, uh, and if you're not particularly fast and not working in mainstream uh, machine-produced comics uh, uh, that tend to come from the States, uh, you need to um, uh, spend an awful lot of time uh, on work that earns you a living. So one day, when I've got the chance, there's some things I'd like to develop myself. Because Greg told me about uh, the creative freedom he has when he does books, and you're working in franchises. Where's the creative freedom there? Well, I, I don't. I mean... Uh, <laughs> oh, you did. You did a lot. I did, I did a lot, yes, um, because I've got a family to support, you know, and that's yeah. where the money is. Um, but, uh, I mean, I've just come off a year of doing my own book, a book called Snarked, which was based on the works of Lewis Carroll, but it was my own creation. You know, the characters were my own interpretation. Um, and, yeah, that's what I'd always prefer to, to do. Um, But uh, reality has to um, interfere with that sometimes just simply because I have to keep earning a living. And I don't think that's a bad thing necessarily. I, I actually like, I mean, like is perhaps not the right word, but I appreciate having to struggle a little bit to do my own thing. Um, I think that actually makes for better work when I do do it, do my own stuff. Um, because, you know, I'm embracing the possibilities more. It's, I don't take them for granted. Dylan, you wanted to say something? You... Oh, just that um, Rogers, the stuff of Rogers that's most widely published in Germany and possibly in Europe um, is the franchise material, but actually the, in the English language, um, I'd say you're probably your best-known stuff is actually creator-owned stuff. It's, it's Fred the Clown and, and that, Snark. I, I don't know about my best-known stuff. My best stuff, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the stuff I noticed. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I think the thing I'm probably best known for in, in America now is The Muppet Show. Um, oh, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Which was great. I mean, that was a yeah, great... Yeah, but I, mean, I was fortunate in that sort of um, coincided with a lot of my own personal concerns as well because a lot of my own personal comics are about vaudeville and... Um, and uh, it's comedy double acts doing stupid things. Um, and the Muppets fit into that quite nicely. But, uh, yeah, no, certainly my, my own personal stuff is, is where my heart is. But there's also the, one of the major problems in working in, in English language comics is that the, uh, the, the structure and the business side of it is not particularly geared to uh, create your own product. You're, uh, you're more, most of your openings, if you're interested in uh, earning a living, are... Uh, Uh, to work for major franchises. Uh, very, very little um, publishing is done uh, and it's outside of the mainstream of comics. And so, uh, from my point of view, it was a major thrill to actually come from New Zealand and become a professional writer, a professional artist in mainstream comics, even though I'm not particularly interested in uh, one, uh, you know, the major part of mainstream comics in America. Uh, it's finding those little edges, um, little places that you can, little niches that you can find in English language comics. And when I went to 
moved to France, suddenly the whole approach changed because I realised that uh, you could be considered an author and, an, and own the material that you produced. And, uh, and to me, that's a major part of the maturity of graphic novels and comics in this part of the world is because you do have a legal stature that's so much more um, protective of being an author and having uh, your, your own material. You don't have that feeling of just being a part of a cog in a machine which is a major, major difference uh, in European comics. When, when you, when any one of you comes to a publisher, or when you go to, to France or to USA, are you in any way um, considered exotic, like the little hobbits drawing comics from the end of the world? <laughs> I get a lot of comments about my accent, yeah, which is, which is neither one thing nor the other these days, because I've been living in London for 20 years, so it's not quite a New Zealand accent and it's not quite a British accent. But they go, oh, I love your accent. So... Uh, Yeah, because nowadays I see a lot of artists coming from even Egypt or, or South America, and, and when you started to go, uh, uh, no, you had to go to Europe, to France. You, you are probably one of the first artists ever to 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 go there. Each one of you. I mean, you left two. Well, I when? think um, I was third. I think Colin was first. Dylan was second, and I was third. I think yeah. so. <laughs> okay. I I do. Um, I remember when I was first doing comics for the American market. They were very personal comics. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the stories were about New Zealand and full of very New Zealand content. And I remember saying to my publisher, is this a problem? Should I be toning this down? And he said, no, no, people love it. It's really exotic, you know. It's great. <laughs> and I thought, great. So I just totally let rip. And, you know, this next issue was full of people speaking Maori with, without translation. <laughs> it's great. It was great. People loved it. <laughs> Maybe a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about the, the, about the future, if we can. Um, what do you think? Where? What's the future of the comics in New Zealand? Where will it go? Which which ways will it go? Well, I think the internet. I think the internet has been a huge game changer. Um, it means that uh, people who, like I was, the last generation, I think, who really had to leave New Zealand in order to forge a career. Um, if I'd been born five years later, even, I think the internet would have made it possible for me to work from Auckland. Yeah, so Greg, Greg did, you didn't have to leave. No, no. I, um, I started very late, I suppose. I mean, I, m most of my career, if it can be said, was unemployment. <laughs> so I, I didn't even get a job, you know, doing anything until um, probably I was uh, almost 30 or something like that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, yeah, I didn't even have a chance to leave New Zealand. So, yeah. so the future of comics in New Zealand will be female artists doing your oi on the internet, right? <laughs> And having it published by other publishers in the, around the world without yeah. having to um, leave, leave the true, comfort of our own armchair. The, the, the internet, like you're saying, is the game changer. We're living in a different world now. Um, and it, it's inspiring, I think. I get letters all the time from young kids wanting to do comics, concept art, and whatever else, illustration, and just invent their own things. And now they're enabled. They, they can do it. They can put it out there. And they may only be able to, at, at first, put it out to a very small audience. But all the tools are there. And they're the, this, you know... It, it's amazing just how and how much that's changed the entire world. I, I love the idea of the wild west of the internet, and I, my only fear is that these big corporations are now coming back in and slowly starting to regulate everything again. So I hope the internet retains that wild west attitude because it, it's changed the world for the better, in my opinion. And it, it's more of a level playing field. I mean, the, well, for now, until the corporations take it over. But, I mean, Lee Chen, this web cartoonist I mentioned in New Zealand, um, She ran a Kickstarter campaign to fund the collected book of her comics. And it became the fourth most successful Kickstarter campaign for comics ever. And she's just this, she's this young woman living in Auckland, New Zealand, you know. But she'd built a following online, and that following paid off. So she quit her day job. She's now just doing comics and illustration full time. Um, and it's because she built an audience directly, globally, through the web, and she doesn't have to depend on waiting for some publisher to pick her up. Um, so I think, you know, the next, the next five years, all bets are off. I don't know what's going to happen, but it's a hell of an exciting time. It's really fun. <laughs> yeah, great, great last words. Uh, ich bedanke mich. Uh, thank you very much, Colin Wilson, Roger Langridge, Dylan Horrocks and Greg Broadmoor für dieses Gespräch. Ich bedanke mich beim Publikum und wünsche noch viel Spaß auf der Messe.